All right. Hello, everyone. So uh, we're very happy to, to have you here with us. I just wanted to introduce the, the group to, to everyone. And that's really strange because you cannot see my screen big. So give me just one second again. All right. OK, that's better. OK, good. Again. So. Thank you for coming. Um, we'll take a few minutes to introduce the group because we have a lot of new people joining every time. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's uh, topic. It's about enterprise agile coaching uh, with Sherry, Alec and Alex. I think Michael is not here, Sherry, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I don't think he's gonna make it today. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, it will be very interesting. I'm interested, I'm very excited, as you can probably notice. So I want to ask you uh, to, to put yourself in a mindset where you, you will be actively listening and participating in the discussion. It will be a panel discussion. Uh, so we, um, we have uh, experienced coaches with us and uh, you, you're free to ask questions anytime during uh, the conversation. And not only free to do that, we want you to ask questions. So anytime you wanna ask a question, uh, maybe just unmute yourself and jump into the conversation, or you can raise your hand, do whatever you, you feel um, comfortable with. So uh, we have a few ground rules. Uh, we would like to ask you if you're not speaking, just mute your microphone. Uh, we have a waiting room for the people who are late. So that's really, we're taking uh, care about, uh, about this uh, logistic. Uh, if you have questions, just ask the question and it would be nice if you can rename your name, putting uh, your name and the city or the country you're coming from. So that, that way we can have an idea who is out there and what's, what's the diversity in the group today. So about our group, we have uh, more than uh, 1800 uh, members so far. So our vision is to be a leading resource for agile management and coaching uh, and best practices. Uh, and we have, of course, a strategy, and the strategy is to invite internationally recognized speakers and coaches as uh, Sherry and Alex today, so that we can be up to date with uh, different trends and tools that can help you in your day-to-day -day work. We have also uh, a YouTube channel. Feel free to go and check it. Uh, we are a group of people. So uh, we have uh, with us, Os uh, with us uh, Oscar today. Oscar, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. All right, thank you. I don't know if Malika is here. Yeah, Malika, she just joined. Uh, there is few time. Okay, so I'll give her a little bit of time. Yeah. Jordan, Jordan, Remy, Leila, Siren. Yeah, there, there, Please, there are no. Yeah, they're, not there. they're not here. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's it. Now is the time. So um, I will close the presentation right now, and we will we will start the conversation. So Alex and Sherry, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? I'll let Alex oh, go first. I always oh, go first. Okay. first. Alex. Let us always go first. All right, all right. So hi, everybody. I'm Sheree Silence. I am a enterprise coach and an executive coach. So I work both with agile organizations and with executives from nonprofit and profit organizations um, around the world. And also am co-owner of Tandem Coaching Academy. And we focus there on developing coaches to do agile coaching and professional coaching and how to really integrate professional coaching into the agile space. So um, I live in Dallas, Texas, native of New Orleans. You might recognize the accent as not a Texas accent. Um, and I think those are the those are the big pieces. Alex, off to you. All right. So I'm Alex Goodenough, and Sheree and I are partnering at Tandem Coaching. 
when we do a lot of training and do a lot of coaching and all other stuff. And in the meantime, um, sometime two years ago, Sheree and Michael had this great idea of writing a book on enterprise coaching and were kind enough to pull me in with a few ideas. And uh, we kind of knocked it out last year. Um, so I'm a software developer kind of by origin, uh, being a software developer for 15 years, uh, then moved to managing, building, nurturing, whatever your go toward to today, uh, teams and uh, organizations, uh, moved into uh, consulting roles, uh, probably too late uh, before enduring a lot of employment, full-time employment. And at some point on my uh, agile journey, uh, met Cherie as the professional coaching trainer. And the rest is the history. So took okay. on professional coaching classes and it turned out to be more than a checkbox on the agile journey. Okay, amazing. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sherry. So Alex, you mentioned a book and it's a book about enterprise coaching. So I'm curious, why enterprise coaching and not team coaching? And what is the enterprise coaching? So maybe some of the people do not know anything about it. So how can you explain the enterprise coaching to someone who is new to it? So we have, how many people do we have? We have, dang, 86 people. I would probably guess and again it's assumption and in coaching we stay away from assumption and i think this one will be pretty much correct that a lot of of 86 people are part of agile transformations is that right yeah everybody okay, just like can. yeah <laughs> okay all right yeah. and so um yeah, we, Shui and I have been parts of agile transformations, whatever that is, for quite some time. And probably I wouldn't be too off the mark uh, noticing that a lot of transformations are not going particularly in the direction where they were supposed to go according to their planners. And uh, what we realized is that there are transformations and there are something else. And a lot of organizations are involved in something else but transformation, which is nothing wrong with that. Absolutely, don't take me wrong. Like, I'm not saying like, if you're not part of agile transformation, you're doing something wrong. You're doing great things, I'm sure. You're contributing to the world and you put the bread on your table. Great. It might just not be a transformation. It might be a framework installation if you're working with teams and you're helping teams to become better, to become better at Scrum, to become better at Kanban, whatever that is, to become better at delivery. You might be working on agile adoption where you're brought in, let's say, by a VP of engineering or CIO to help them develop their engineering organization. And you probably see that at some point you're hitting that glass ceiling that's over you and over that VP of engineering, over that top stakeholder who brought you in. And at some point you're like, I need to talk to HR. I need to start talking to HR. I need to start talking to finance. I need to start talking to marketing sales. What the hell those sales are doing selling these things? My engineering department is not designed to implement, right? You're working, on agile. Yeah. you're working on agile adoption and you're hitting that ceiling. Agile transformation is different. Agile transformation is done at the enterprise level, where the initiative comes from the top dog, where the C-suite is completely invested. And when the whole organization is being transformed from top to bottom, Right, And uh, in our books, besides kind of mentioning these levels of engagement and how coaches might be more conscientious about choosing what, what they want to do and where they want to go, we actually make a point that transformation is something different and giving coaches tools and techniques and mindset and ability to come in at all these engagements, 
adoption, transformation, and even framework installation, which is great. I love frameworks and it's great. You just need to know what to do there and how to enter the organization, how to proceed, how to help the organization and how to gracefully exit. All right, so that's the, that's the kind of enterprise coaching in the mindset that we think would benefit a lot of coaches if they adopt it. Mm. Yeah, so what do you really, think, Shari? Yeah, I think that's good. And what I find um, is a big frustration point for coaches everywhere over and over is because they don't really understand that there's these three different, at least three different types of engagements. They often get pulled in to do team coaching and to co and to do like process installation. Sometimes they get called in to do agile adoption, but there's this thinking in their mind and it's like, no, we're doing transformation. And they keep thinking they're doing transformation. And if they get called in to do um, process adoption, they're getting really frustrated when things beyond the team aren't changing, when the culture is not changing, when, when the company is not willing to change org structure or compensation and things like that, and all that stuff's getting in the way. So um, I think it's really important just to understand what's the type of engagement you're in. There's nothing wrong with any of them. They all add value on some level. Um, you, will, you will hit the ceiling at some level. And um, if it's what you enjoy doing and it's what you want to do, totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. So Shiri, you mentioned it's good to know what type of engagement you are in. So I'm curious, like for me, ex uh, for example, I'm a job coach and I am looking at all those offers, you know, job offers. So how do I know that this is the right engagement for me? Well, congratulations, you've got all those job offers, first of all, yeah. <laughs> and so I think that that comes in in the beginning before you ever hit the ground. So um, I know many of you are probably consultant, contract type um, agile coaches. I know that's big in the agile world. And then there's also some people who are joining full time. And so especially if you're coming in as a consultant or on a contract basis, really understanding before you get there and having conversations with, with, with the people who you're working with about, well, what is the problem they're trying to solve? And how much change are they actually willing to make? And what is it that they envision? Where, how do they envision the outcomes? And um, really, how much power do they have? So if you hear, often you'll hear clients saying, oh yeah, we want agile transformation. That's a buzzword. Like who really knows what that means? It's like, we, we want to coach. Do you even know what coaching is, right? So don't just go on what they said they wanted, help them to understand and really clarify, well, what's the business problem you're trying to solve? And at what level is this business problem? And what kind of investment are you willing to make and able to make? And how much power do you have to actually make the investment you want? Often what you'll find is, well, first, they don't always know exactly what they want. They just want things to improve. And um, often you'll find that they really don't want agile transformation. They're not thinking that big. And it's usually not at that level that they're engaging you. You know, it's interesting because when I talk to coaches, 90% of them are like, we're doing agile transformation. And when I talk to clients, 5% um, actually want agile transformation. So there's a big disconnect there. And so um, I think it would be helpful to just clarify the language so that we start to understand. It's just like coaching. Well, what is a coach? They're that person who comes in and fixes my company for me, right? No, not really. <laughs> I have a question, uh, uh, Kerry and uh, Alex. You know, business agility has become a imperative to business success. Uh, current agile product uh, approaches, example, Scrum, it's become one, primarily cover the technical delivery process and do not provide a sufficient business strategy, context, and process. So could you give your point of view about how applying current and emerging business agility thinking and model is necessary for coaches engaged at enterprise level? 
So I think I think you're asking like how to how to help the client to move from thinking in frameworks to moving to kind of business agility. Is that the yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I apologize that it was like very, very muffled. Um, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's basically the same idea. There is nothing wrong with the with the process and frameworks. Absolutely nothing wrong, right? And uh, we are not in business of bashing one framework over another. I love Scrum. I love Kanban. Hell, I love parts of Safe. I will admit that publicly, right? Uh, and at the same time, they are, they are very limited in their reach. Scrum has never made agile enter uh, Scrum has never made an enterprise agile enterprise. Agility is about mindset. Agility is how we think about delivering value to the customer. Let's face it, enterprises like some enterprises, a lot of enterprises are out there to make money. A lot of enterprises are out there for the public benefit. And a lot of enterprises out there for goodness of the world, for goodness of the community, right? So they have different outcomes in mind and none of the frameworks will actually get them better at delivering these outcomes, right? The frameworks will help them at the lower level. So when I hear uh, a CIO is asking me, I know you're Kanban trainer. I know you are PST with scrum.org. Can you come and train my teams in scrum? My answer is yes, I can. What do you want on the other end when I'm done with them training? Oh, they need to be better. They don't deliver. Our customer are dissatisfied. Okay, now we have a real conversation. Your customer are dissatisfied and you are jumping to a conclusion that if your teams are trained in Scrum, your customer satisfaction will go up, right? What I'm not going to tell them, I'm not going to tell them all that I'm telling you, like, well, Scrum will not help you. You are just a moron thinking about that, right? You're jumping to conclusion. The conversation we are going to be having, so your customer are dissatisfied. What are your observations? What are your thoughts about the, the sources of this dissatisfaction? And this is the core of the coaching conversation. So should we start with help them with thinking through outcomes? In the book, we talk at length about a technique of well-formed outcomes and coaching primarily leaders and primarily the drivers of agile transformation and agile adoption through the process of defining this well-formed outcome. What's the goal? Why are you going to do that? What resources do you have? Do you have everything under control? Uh, is that the goal kind of yours or is it imposed by somebody else? What's the ecology of this goal? And all those, sorry? And all those good stuff, there's like, seven or nine steps in defining this outcome. And as you imagine, this is not a 10 minute conversation, right? This is an invitation. And again, we have this in the title of the book, it's invitational approach to coaching, right? So it behooves us to invite these stakeholders to have this conversation. So it seems like you are talking about bigger things here that uh, just training the teams. Would you like to have that conversation? I have experience in helping organizations to improve customer satisfaction, to help them flow the value from concept to cash. Would you like to have to explore this conversation? And usually the answer is yes. And that's how you start getting in the door. And that's how you start this conversation. And at the end of the day, in many cases, it becomes, yeah, training is a part. It's a necessary part. And Scrum absolutely might belong there. And it's just a small part of that. Yeah, I think the thing to remember is that you can't take some a framework is something that worked somewhere for somebody the way they, and the way it worked is the way they wrote it down, right? And, and so people come and learn this and they're like, yep, I wanna take this thing right out of the box, unpackage it, bring it to my other client and just drop it in there and it's supposed to work. It's, 
it doesn't really work that way, right? It, just because you worked at another organization and you use some framework and you use 20 different ways to solve problems, you come to the new organization, they've got what appears on the surface to be the same problems. Those solutions will not work prepackaged the way they did at the other place. Why? Because it's a different system. There's a different political system. There's a different human system. There's different technical systems. There's different policy and procedure systems, right? Every, it's a whole different place. So while the concepts and the theories of how things work and your experience is extremely helpful, you can't just shove a square peg in a round hole and expect it to have a perfect fit. So while you're introducing these things, it's a matter of here's what I've seen helpful, here's what I've experienced, and let's talk about how something like that might work here and if it will, if it will fit. The client knows their organization better than you ever will especially as a consultant, as a contractor. I mean, if you've been a full-time employee and you've been there for a long time, great, you know the system. That's a different um, conversation. But for many of us, we don't, or we're newer to the system, right? And so you have to trust the ability of that client to know and understand their company and what will and what won't work. There's too many agile coaches who are like, here's the checkbox, you need to follow this. And if you're not doing your daily scrum in 15 minutes and for God's sake, you better be standing up, um, then you're not agile. Well, how does a daily scrum bring business value? And how does standing up bring business value? That's not the solution. It's the implementation of a piece of the solution, right? And so as you're introducing frameworks or solutions or whatever it is you have, it's really a matter of don't think about the solution before you think about the problem. Don't come in here thinking, oh, we got to do Scrum. That's the solution. Hello, what's the problem? What's the problem we're trying to solve, right? And so when we talk about this invitational coach uh, approach, this in invitational approach to coaching, what that means is this is an invitation to have partnership with the client. I am here to be your partner to solve your problems, and it's your job to solve your problems. I can't do the work for you. If I come into your company and take over and start fixing everything, well, what happens when I leave? The fix leaves with me because all of the compliance I gain by forcing people to do stuff, it's gone, right? And so it's an invitation to partnership. And, and in that partnership, it's about looking at what the client needs. What is not working for you? What is the, what's impeding your progress towards getting the business results you want? Um, many agile coaches, I'll tell you, the number one question I get from agile coaches is, how do you deal with resistance? Nobody wants to work with me. Nobody wants to do stuff. I came, they hired me, and they're like, go away. We don't that want to was talk my to next you. question, Shiri. I <laughs> How do you deal with resistance? That's the number one question I get. And the answer is stop creating it, first of all. Right? Just stop creating it. We create resistance when we come in and we think we know better. And we look at our client like they're broken and they need us to fix them. And I'm a superhero and I'm here to save the day. And um, then we start looking at leaders and talking to them like they don't know how to do their job. And um, they were running that company before you got there and they can afford to hire you. So they must be doing something right. Right. So instead of assuming that I know everything, you know nothing, and I'm here to fix your company, how about build a partnership with them, trust that they're competent. And instead of working on trying to force your agenda, you know, you come in, you look around and you're like, oh my goodness, this is not agile. That's not right. That's not right. You've got to do this and this and this. Man, drop that. That just creates resistance and it doesn't help. What you want to be having the conversations about is what are the problems you're trying to solve and what's in the way? And what are the big things that I might be able to partner with you to think through those so we can figure out some experiments to try so we can get to a solution? If you go, if you're there for them, you have a better chance of getting acceptance. If you're there for you and their job is to make you look good by making your transformation go right, 
then then you're not going to really get much, right? Because what's their incentive to make you successful? That's that's not really why they brought you there. Yeah. Oh. And one, one thing I always think about, and I know it might sound very corny on the surface, and it actually works. Your only job as a consultant in the organization is to make your manager look good. It is very true. Their success is your success. And it goes deeper than brown nosing and all that stuff where usually people kind of go, oh, you're talking about like this thing. No, when you make your manager, your hiring manager look good, it means that you help them achieve their goals. Hopefully, not always, but hopefully, their goals aligned with those of the organization, with higher levels, and with the organization as a whole. So making them look good, making help them achieve their goal, you're helping the organization achieve the goal. And I have two of my favorite sayings about the, um, the uh, resistance and the change. Well, first of all, nobody resisted the change they helped co-design. What it actually tells us, you need to invite, you need to invite the wisdom, the experience and the skills of people who are there to co-create the change. Here's what I know. I know Scrum, I know Kanban, I know all this stuff and I know that it might work. What I don't know, how it's going to be working in your organization. And this is a core skill of a coach, of professional coach that will so, so desperately want to bring, to build the bridge between professional and agile coaching that we as coaches need to be really comfortable in the space of not knowing. And as consultants, we usually come in with the mindset that we know we have the answers and that's what people expect of us. You know what? It really behooves us to say, I don't know. Here's what I know. And here I know how this might help you. Let's work together. Let's work in the partnership so that we can co-create the change and implement this change together and help this change achieve, help, help it achieve your goals. So Alex, how do you find the balance between being a consultant and a coach? And how do you support your clients into all this? It's a tough balance. Sometimes it's like on a ball and sometimes it's like on a grenade that has that pin kind of pulled out, right? Uh, what helps me is to adopt coaching mindset and use coaching competencies as my default stance. My default stance is to be curious. My default stance is to hold the client, what we call naturally creative, resourceful, and whole, not as broken. I'm not here to fix you. Well, first, by the way, I cannot fix you. Like if you're broken, you need to see another specialist. I cannot fix you and it's not my job to fix you. My job is to help you get more awareness and bring my skills from my past to help you get where you want. Because let's face it, nobody hires me for me being an ICF PCC. That's great skills and nobody would hire me just for that. Maybe like my life coaching clients. What my enterprise clients hire me for, like I talk to CTOs, I talk to CIOs, they are not reaching because I'm coaching. They are reaching because I've been and walked in their shoes because I build the teams, I build the organizations, and I had success with that. They bring me for that. What I come in, I'm not saying, well, we are going to do this, we are going to build these teams, we are going to reorganize this. I get really curious about what their problem is. I, I, I make people being seen and heard. Because when they talk to a coach, when they talk to a coach who is in coaching mindset, who understand how to use empathy, how to use other coaching competencies, 
they feel seen, they feel that their problems are heard and they are opening up to partner with a coach to solve their problems rather than they see an arrogant jerk who has, who commands like several uh, hundred dollars an hour uh, rate and who is here to fix them and who is here to tell them everything that's wrong with them, right? So again, I bring my expertise, I bring my skills, I bring my experience from the past. I know what worked for me, I know what worked for my organizations and teams in the past, and what I don't know what will work here, and what I will ensure is that we co-design this through open conversations, through exchange of ideas, through a lot of listening and going back and forth, we will co-design some experiments which we will run, inspect and adapt and go forward in that open manner and our coaching mindset is kind of the default stance mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I would like to add to this that um, let's first be really clear. If you're a coach, an adult coach, let's be specific, you are not only coaching. There is an expectation you are hired as an adult coach because you have adult expertise. What they don't expect from you is that when they say, okay, I'm really stuck, how do I, how do, I do this? For you to say, well, how do you think you should do it? That's a quick way to get like punched in the face and thrown out the door, right? When I was running coaching organizations and I had a bunch of enterprise coaches reporting to me, number one phone call I got from executives was get this person out of here. Every time we ask what to do, they're like, how would you do it? Get them out of here. I don't know why I'm paying them. Get them out. Right? Why? Because that's not coaching. Right? Coaching doesn't mean that all you can do is ask questions. Questions are one skill and it's one part of coaching. And just because you learned professional coaching does not mean that every conversation is a coaching conversation. There are times when what you should be doing is consulting and training and, uh, and mentoring and all that stuff. The difference between the way a consultant only stance might do it and a coaching approach to doing it would be like a consultant would have that thinking of, okay, I'm here, that's broke, that's broke, that's broke, this is how you fix it, you have to do it this way, go do it. Where a coach is more asking what's going on, What's happening? What are the problems you're trying to solve? Why is this a problem? What's the outcomes? Um, and, and, and asking the client, helping the client to start to figure things out and saying, well, here's what I think. In my, in my experience, this thing right here, it, it doesn't work like this. You have to do it this other way. And that's what I've seen effective. So knowing that, what do you want to do for your organization? And they might say, well, yeah, let's figure that out. And they might say, we can't do that. This is not the time. I don't have the authority. I am not willing to go that far. Fine. It's your company. So what do you want to do? Great. I'll support you in that. And you'll get down the road and they'll get as much success as they can. And then either they will stop getting success and say, we need to try something different. And you can say, okay, you want to try this? Or they, that's it. I mean, does that make sense? Like it's their, it's their decision. It's their company. So trying to force them to do what you would do if it was your company, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Just go create right. your own company and run it. That will be more yeah. successful. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> if you think about it, uh, I, I, I would probably not be too far off the mark saying that 85 people here read Lisa's book, and I hope 85 people will read our book as well. So Lisa's, Lisa's contribution to Agile community cannot be overestimated. If she just created that X-Wing model and stopped, that would have been already groundbreaking. Yes. The model, the model is like 10, 12 years old, and she and it's still amazing how precise it is and how simple it is. There are many, many attempts to complicate that model wherever it will go, I don't know. But if you think about this model, it's marvelous in its simplicity and it includes four stances. So it's on the content side, it includes training and mentoring 
And on the process side, it includes professional coaching and facilitation, and it rests on a solid foundation of business transformational and technical knowledge. What's missing from that, what I call the meta skill or meta kind of meta model, uh, it's the skill that uh, most masterful coaches master. They know how to move across the stances easily and when precisely to move across them, how to deep into each and every of the knowledge domain, how and when to pull on those domains so that it benefits the client. So if you master the model, your next step is to master the fluidity that you can move across the stances in the model. And that's where you are an amazing agile coach. Mm, yeah. So there is a question in the box about how does understanding systems dynamics um, fit in to all this. Um, the question is around at the enterprise level, but I think system dynamics and understanding how to coach systems um, is a part of all of it, not just at the enterprise level, because what you're doing is you're coaching systems. They're, they're human systems. And whether it's a team or an organization or a whole enterprise, it's all systems and there's embedded systems inside, right? All these little groups. And so when you are coaching at whatever level, especially as you're looking at the wider organization and the wider enterprise, it's really important to be able to sit, stand back and to, um, to see and observe and understand how things that happen in one part of the system actually impact other parts of the system, right? And so often you're like, when you're working with teams, something's happening, whatever, there's a problem happening. You have to stop and think about, well, is this an isolated event? Is this this person? Is this just happening on this team? Or am I seeing this happen in different places? This is showing up in different places of the organization, right? Because it might be isolated and it might be systemic. And so it's a, it's a systemic problem. Fixing it on the team is only a temporary band-aid because you're going to see it everywhere else. And so it's a matter of understanding and looking at and helping the, the people who you're coaching to understand this is a cultural issue. This is a systemic issue. This is a policy issue. It's bigger than just, we have people on teams who they're not getting along and they're all trying to be the superhero. Well, why is that? Is it because these five team members don't like each other and we need to just fire them because they're no good? Well, maybe it's part of the problem is that there's a compensation system that's that's wrong, or there is a um, performance management system that's wrong, and it's forcing people to go against each other because it's the only way they're going to get the raise because they get um, graded on a bell curve and all that stuff. That is a systemic problem. It's not a team problem. And so part of the work you're doing when you're working with organizations and especially at the enterprise level, that's where a lot of these systemic issues are. Sometimes you got systemic issues like at the, at the engineering product kind of level that that VP or whoever can handle, but often they go outside of it. And that's why enterprise coaching is important because it goes beyond just engineering. It goes beyond just your product group or your business group that you're working with in in that little bubble, um, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And also something to be said there uh, of the importance of alignment when we are changing a lot, when this changes occurs, how that's aligned, if at all, with cultural values and company values. We do a lot of training around coaching for values, coaching for values for individuals and how the values show themselves in the systems and in the systems coaching, in the team coaching, in the organizational coaching. And when you see this dissonance, when you see this disconnect, when you see this tension in the systems and systems, whether it's group of people, whether it's two individuals, whether it's an organization, whether it's a leadership team, Everything is a system. Uh, absolutely fantastic read if you want uh, Danella Meadows uh, thinking in systems. She absolutely nails it, right? So uh, how does that 
aligns with the values that are being kind of, hopefully the values were not created by an executive team that went on a posh two, uh, two three days, um, whatever, breakout. And then on Monday, they came back with, here's our current values for the company. And everybody is cynical, right? So uh, values and listening for the values, listening for the alignment and listening for tension. What's the value of the teams that you're working with? What's the value of the department and organization you're working with, with the stated values? How does that serve? How does that prevent the team to move forward or the organization to move forward? Or how does that help them? So um, just kind of another level of listening and another level of thinking and mirroring it back. Okay, great. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so anyone, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, we have two uh, time for two, two questions maybe because we end at uh, six o'clock. So we have like 14 minutes left. I see a couple um, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. We have I two questions that. for uh, Merv and uh, uh, Ben. If you can unmute yourself and ask your question, it's open discussion. Yeah, Merv, do you wanna go with your question? Hi, uh, hello. This is a wonderful uh, conversation. Actually, I'm very excited about it. Uh, we are transforming a large company, and uh, we have a lot of little managers, you know, uh, and we have a. Uh, we have traveling to mobilize them with the agile mindset. Uh, so do you have any suggestion about it? Yeah, I can see you smile. <laughs> yeah, there's poor yeah, Just like when you say mobilize, I see like the armies of middle managers walking <laughs> in one direction, no, no. like with the, with a drum beat and all that. Uh, <laughs> mobilization is an interesting word. And I, I, I'll probably repeat myself and I would say, be a servant for those managers. Figure out what they want. Because people are not evil. People do, well, I mean, nobody gets out of bed in the morning and say, I'm going to do something bad for myself today. People have great and good intentions and they are serving their needs. So figuring out what the need for these middle managers, and by the way, they might be different from the needs of those VPs and C-level people who hired you to do this. What is their need? What will be better for them when they will get whatever mobilized means? How their life will change and how you can find that grain of truth that they will get kind of excited about. Right? Because if you kind of bring in like your VP statement that our organization will be great, our customers will be happy, our revenues will be whatever, I mean, they probably don't give a flying kite about that. They, are, they, they, they care about their uh, rank and file developers who are leaving the organization. They care about that they are overwhelmed and they are on the phone 24 seven. They care about something different. Figure out what's their needs and what's their goals and figure out how this agile transformation will help them and speak their language. That's one of the core things that I see, like we have the message from the top and we are moving this message to the bottom without changing it. Well, it doesn't land always. Yeah. You know, I think managers get a bad, um, a bad rap, right? So um, historically what I've seen is agile coaches think managers are like, the devil or something. And they have this habit of coming in and doing this thing that kind of resembles, look, there's no managers in Agile, sit down over there, quit telling people what to do. And then they proceed to tell people what to do. And they just take over the manager's job, which is, I find quite hilarious. Um, and so think about their position for just a minute. They're in the middle. Teams at the bottom are like, yes, we want empowerment. People at the top are like, give the power to the teams. And then there's people in the middle, that, these managers that are like, how am I going to feed my family? Because I don't seem to have a job anymore. And everything I ever knew 
I went to school for it. I've been successful all these years. I've worked my butt off and now everybody's telling me I'm worthless and I have no value. Well, no wonder they're like, I don't know what to do here, right? We do the same thing to project managers, y'all. Don't let, you know, don't let that slide. And so really the managers are valuable. We don't really want self-managing teams. We usually want self-organizing teams, right? And so these managers do play a function without the power that they have in the organization to actually remove the organizational impediments and to get things where they need to be to make the change that changes that need to be made to clear a path for the teams to deliver, then, then you're going to be in trouble, right? So rather than punishing them and putting them in a corner and rather than... Um, taking what you believe is the way they should act and believe and behave and think and speak and all that and pushing it on them to tell them they're doing it all wrong, find out what it is they want. Okay? Mm -hmm. Get an agreement with them about what it is you're gonna do together, right? And if they even want you to talk to them about how they're talking to people, right? Maybe they're not interested in that and that's okay. And, and so I think that the other mistake we make here is, we look through these managers and we're like, those two aren't on board and they're making my life hard. And then we put 80% of our energy into those two people who are resistant. That is not the way to create momentum. Well, you do create momentum. You just create it in the wrong direction, right? So the thing that's making the most noise is where people are going to go. And so leave the resistant alone. Focus on people who want to move forward. Focus on the leaders who want to move forward, who want, who actually want to be involved and make change that they want your help with. And that will get bigger and people will eventually move over to that side. By the time you get down to the resistors, they will either have quit or given in, right? So don't, don't waste your energy creating the wrong type of momentum. Focus on where you can have effect and build relationships with those who aren't ready to accept you. Yeah. And I want to follow up with uh, Yelena's asking, like, what is their hunger for command and control? Um, I don't know. I would assume there are people who are hungry for that. I have never met a single individual who is, I want to be dominated and I want to be commanded and I want to be under control. I truly believe that mastery, autonomy and purpose is everybody's motivation. I mean, we can talk about fringes all day long. The core is mastery, autonomy and purpose. So, I would have probably reframed that if I start seeing hunger for command and control, how much of my judgment I'm bringing to the table? What is under the, underneath that? It's probably hunger for clarity, hunger mm -hmm. to bring the bread on the table for their family. It's probably hunger for understanding what's going on, hunger for purpose, for meaning. As Shuri said, they've been working hard it's not really easy to get from rank and file to be a manager, a, sing, a senior manager, a director. They work their butts off, right? So they have the need, some, some people do have the need for titles and we need to decide whether it's aligned with organizational values. We need to have that conversation. And most people, they are good people. They have really, really good intentions and it's not the hunger for command and control, it's the hunger for clarity, for, uh, for moving forward, for achieving the goals. And the, the way how we actually formulate that, how we put that in the words, it actually decides what, it, it actually makes a huge difference if we as agile coaches are successful or our agile transformation quote unquote goes in, dip, in a little bit different direction. Yeah, you know, if you think for a minute about what makes you, every individual here as a human, what makes you want to start grabbing and controlling things? It's usually, I don't know what's going on, so I need to get some control, right? So when, when managers are doing this controlling thing, I, I need to come to all the standups. I need to know what's going on. I need to, you know, tell people what to do, whatever. It's a, it's a strategy. 
we build up strategies in our lives for how we interact with uncertainty, for how we interact with a lack of transparency. And so they're just going to what they know. And so when I see this need to control thing um, showing up, my question is, what's the problem you're trying to solve, right? This need to control is solving a problem for them. And so what's going on that you've got this kind of need to control? Of course, I would never say it that way because that's a good way to get thrown out, right? But, but what's happening? So I noticed that like you, you do, you, you keep stepping in and like you're assigning work to people and whatever, you know? So what's happening there? What's, there's a problem here that you're trying to solve. How can we, how can we help you? Right. And so by understanding the problem and bringing the problem to the team, hey, here's the problem. How do we solve this? How do we create the transparency this manager needs? Right. And so I really think it's a matter of just understanding human nature and, and being willing to, to listen, because often that's the key. I've been in that situation before where I'm like, OK, everything's falling apart. Stop. I'm taking control. We're going to do it this way. And then I'll let the leash out a little bit at a time when as things are under control. I know you've done that too. And, and so it's just human nature, right? So what is the thing that's causing them to have that, oh no, I've got to get it under control. Let's deal with that thing, right? Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Sherry and Alex. I learned a lot today. I learned that we need to uh, to focus on problems, on outcomes, not telling the people what uh, what they should be doing, uh, being there for them. I learned how to do a good and how to have a successful transformation. Actually, I learned a lot. So thank you so much for for your time. I hope this was useful and meaningful to everyone here. Thank you so much for coming. I don't know, Sherry or Alex, do you want to say a few words before closing? Yep, I guess just closing thoughts are, it was wonderful to be here with you all, thank you. If your company or you need help with transformation or coaching or training or whatever, we're available, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd love to talk with you and see how we might partner together. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Thank you so much, Alex and Cherry. Uh, it was a, a great, uh, I learned a lot with uh, this meetup. It was a great conversation. Uh, so uh, we we hope to, me personally, I hope to go to, to buy your book very soon, to order your book and then start to read it. <laughs> uh, I just, um, <laughs> just, just, we can uh, see the bronze. book uh, with Elena. Uh, yeah. Elena is my favorite person on those, well, and Pavel, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All of you are our favorite people here. I'll, um, I'll post the link again in the chat. That way um, for the, oh, that's a Zoom link. Um, we'll post that link in um, so that people can get it if they're interested so they'll know where to find it. I type for it faster. All right, there's a book link. <laughs> We can also publish it in the in the group in the event, so the people who miss the event they can still go and grab the book. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for oh, yeah. having us. It was thank you so fun. much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.